you say, oh, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit when I was born of the Spirit, well, I don't think anyone's going to say it's not possible. I think uh, they're going to say if, if you have the marks of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, then that must have happened. But for many of us, it has been a second step in our Christian experience. And so we have this bookcase with baptism with the Holy Spirit, and the top section has books on filling of the Holy Spirit for purity, for inward victory. And the bottom section is anointing of the Holy Spirit for power, for the gifts of the Spirit. Emphasizing, you see, that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is an inward and an outward endowment. Power for inward purity and power for outward witnessing. And then the third bookcase is labeled Walking in the Spirit. And it deals with union with Christ and with ministering life. Now I tell you that to point out that really on these Sunday evenings, We've been dealing again and again with the third bookcase and with that third step. And uh, I noticed that really the seminar this morning that John leads on baptism with the Holy Spirit was overflowing. And really I think the truth is that many of us are at that stage. I think that's true, isn't it? Many of us are at that stage where we're having some difficulty and some defeat in our Christian lives and what we need is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, some of us are baptized with the Holy Spirit and have come into a full surrender, and we really need to be walking in the Spirit and learning how to walk in the Spirit. But I think it's necessary, maybe, from time to time on Sunday evenings, to back up and deal again with that crisis experience, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'd like to share a little about tonight, and you'll forgive me there for not dealing with the Christian's desires. But in fact, just going back in the light of this morning's message and dealing once more with the baptism with the Holy Spirit and the need of it in our lives. I had uh, some uh, cream in that uh, glass jar and uh, I left it too long. Yeah, I did. And uh, it's really quite a smell. And uh, there's nothing as miserable as sour cream. Uh, Now, do you see, dear ones, that if I leave that like that, and you bring me some uh, fresh cream and I say, okay, I've got a jar here and I take your fresh cream and I pour it in here. You know what will happen. And you'll say to me, listen, Pastor, if you pour that fresh cream in on top of the sour cream, the sour cream will affect the fresh cream in a matter of a day or so. Now, that's foolish. What you need to do is clean that sour cream right out and then put the fresh cream in. Now, loved ones, That's the situation with many of us in our Christian lives. We have come to the place where we realized there was a lot of sour cream in our lives that we needed to empty out. And we did come into a real repentance. And we received Jesus into our spirits. And it wasn't long after that until Jesus began to make us aware that there was something sour underneath that we had never really got to the bottom of and that was still lying there in our lives. There was a doubleness of will that we had never really dealt with. And do you see what happens? While we allow that to remain there, you can receive more of the Holy Spirit in every Sunday and you can receive an especial supply of the Holy Spirit at Easter time and a great supply of the Holy Spirit if you're on a retreat or at a series of evangelistic services. But do you see that the same thing happens all the time? If that stuff at the bottom of your heart has not been dealt with, then the Holy Spirit will soon be soured again by that sour lack of full surrender at the bottom of your heart. Now, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We're saying that the only way to get that our double will out of your life is to allow the Holy Spirit to be poured in and displace it completely. And to do that, you have to be willing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the whole deal in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is coming to a place of honesty where you really do want the Holy Spirit to fill every part of you. Now, brothers and sisters, you may say, Oh, Pastor, if you had the trouble I have with my temper, you'd know I want it. But, loved ones, there's a great part of us that want so much of the Holy Spirit, but not completely. And that's what the struggle is all about, you see. 
Now, this is built in to the whole message of salvation. And, and maybe we should see that. Uh, Acts 2 and 38. You remember that famous verse where uh, the people on the day of Pentecost came up to Peter and they asked him, uh, what must we do to be saved? And it's Acts 2 and 38. And Peter's answer, you see, really implies uh, these two important works that the Holy Spirit does within us, regenerating us and filling us. Acts 2 and verse 38. And Peter replied, you remember, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, the forgiveness of our sins is what Jesus' blood was shed for. Jesus' blood, you remember, I suggested this morning, was shed to enable God to forgive us and remain a just God, even though we were sinners and deserved death. And in a real sense, therefore, Jesus' death was for God. In a real sense, you see, Jesus died for his Father's sake, to enable his Father to forgive sinners who in all justice deserve death. And this enabled his Father to forgive us, even though we deserve death, because his justice was wrought upon Jesus. Now that was for the remission of our sins. But you see, the second step is, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Bible means receive the Holy Spirit, not only to regenerate you and renew your spirit and give you a desire for God, but to fill your spirit completely, to cleanse your heart by faith. Now, those two things are implied in Jesus' death for us. And dear ones, they run right through the whole of Scripture. Jesus died so that God for, could forgive us our sins. Secondly, Jesus died so that we might die in him and God might destroy and render inoperative that rebellious will of ours. Now, you see, we don't accept that at all most of the time. Most of the time we say, yes, Jesus died so that God could forgive us our sins. Now our job is to suppress and repress that rebellious will. And that's what most of us live in, isn't it? We, we live, believe that Jesus died so that God could forgive us our sins. We couldn't find it. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. But when it comes to victory within, we begin to use our great willpower. And we begin to suppress and repress that attitude within us which begets individual sins on the outside. Now, if you'd just be patient and look at those two verses that we did check this morning, you remember I suggested that the first four and a half chapters of Romans deals all the time with sins in the plural, acts and thoughts and words that are disobedient to God. And the second three and a half chapters deals all the time with sin in the singular, the inward attitude that wants to disobey God. Now, that's Romans 3, the ones, and uh, verse 25. You remember it mentions there that Jesus died for the remission of our sins, whom God put forward as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, even though he forgives us and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Now, you see, the emphasis there is on sins and the forgiveness of our sins. Now, would you look at Romans 6 and verse 6, where the emphasis is not on sins, but on the inward attitude of sin which produces those sins. Romans 6 and verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin in the singular. In other words, there's a real need for us not only to believe that Jesus has died for our sins and to be willing to let go of our sins, but there's a real need for us to realize that we were crucified with Christ and to be willing to let go of self so that he is able to free us through the Holy Spirit. Now, there isn't a place, dear ones, where you cannot find these two things emphasized, you see. You look at 1 John 1 and verse 9, and it's a verse we often quote about how really to become a Christian. 1 John 1 and verse 9.
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins. And that's the part that we again and again preach in our churches. He will forgive us our sins. But do you see the second? And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now it is God who will cleanse us from the unrighteousness within. It is not ourselves by willpower or the power of positive thinking or Paul Turnier or fellowship or through Bible study and prayer. It is God himself who through the Holy Spirit will do this. Now why do we say through the Holy Spirit? Well, Acts 15 and 9 states what Peter felt happened on the day of Pentecost, you remember. Acts 15 and verse 9. You remember there's difficulty about receiving the Gentiles in without first becoming Jews. And Acts 15 and verse 8, Peter explains this. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. In other words, when we share this need to die with Jesus, we're not making the Christian faith harder or the Christian life harder. We're making it possible, loved ones. It is impossible to destroy that evil inward inclination you have to have your own way and insist on your own rights. It is impossible to do that by human willpower. The only way is to see that God, through the Holy Spirit, does it. And he will only do it if you're willing to die to self. Now, you know, if you say, oh, well, brother, now why don't we share this more in our churches? Loved ones, you know why. Because we want to retain some free will ourselves. We call it free will. It isn't free will. It's a slavery to self. But you know that in our churches we're anxious for an admission into heaven. We want our sins covered by Jesus' blood. We don't want to be found in hell at the end of this life. But when it comes to the way we live this present life, again and again, we want to be able to live it our own way. Now, you'll see, you know, as you go through Scripture, it just isn't on the books, loved ones. It just is not that way. Now, look at Second Corinthians 5 and 14. And you begin to see a, a magnificent symmetrical logic, you know, about God's word when you see the two events that took place when Jesus died on the cross. Not only the bearing of the penalty for our sins, but the bearing of ourselves into death with him. Second Corinthians 5 and 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we are convinced that one has died for all. That's for the forgiveness of our sins. Therefore, all have died. In other words, the two emphases are there. That Jesus died for us, but that we also died with him. And really, until we enter into that, there'll be no experience of resurrection. You find it in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36. If you look at it there, Ezekiel 36 and verses 25 and 26. And again, the two sides of the work that Jesus did on the cross. Ezekiel 36 and 25 through 26. It's, uh, oh well, I didn't give you the page because few of you have this Bible. 746, dear ones, if you have that Bible we use on the mornings. Ezekiel 36 and verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And it says that God will sprinkle clean water upon us, sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon us, so that we are looked upon as righteous because of Jesus' righteousness. Then in verse 26, the real change that he will work in us. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And again and again, throughout Scripture, there's the emphasis. God will treat you as righteous because Jesus has died for you, but he will make you righteous by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is pictured for us, you remember, in the Israelites. You remember, they passed over the Red Sea and they escaped from the bondage and the slavery that they were in in Egypt. And then, like many of us, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, coming back to their old campsites, 
making the same old resolutions, we're going to win through this time. We're going to obey your Lord, whatever the cost. And it wasn't until they eventually crossed the Jordan and into Canaan that they came into a place of rest. And there was, in a sense, two different experiences for them. A coming free from slavery and then an entering into the rest that God had for them. Now that's what many of us have found, you know, in this baptism with the Holy Spirit. That it suddenly seems to bring you into a rest. That's why many of us call it the second rest of the people of God. Where you cease from your labors. You cease from that striving to overcome those miserable habits. And you enter in through the filling of the Holy Spirit into an effortless life of obedience. But those are just a few of the, the pictures in the New Testament. And I have others here, you know, and could go through them. Now, where is the problem normally? in the born-again Christian or the child of God who has not entered into baptism with the Holy Spirit. Where is the problem? Well, I suggested where it is this morning. It's not normally in the outward life. Most of us can walk in a fair degree of outward victory. We've been trained. We have strong wills. We're sophisticated, Western, educated people. We have a fair degree of control over what we do outwardly and what we say outwardly. But the problem with most of us is in the area of attitudes or the area of reactions or the area of motives or the area of tempers or desires. You see, we're willing to do something for God and we get up here and we do it and we're not quite sure what was the real motive behind it. We believe that it was for the glory of God and we say praise God when somebody thanks us for it but often inside there's, there's a great welling up of pride in the old natural abilities. And there's a great pleasure derived from all eyes being upon us. Now, normally, dear ones, it's in the area of motives where we have our problems. Or the area of attitudes, you know. You can hold back from being angry with a brother. You can hold back from outwardly criticizing someone. But you know if your heart was to be projected on one of those outdoor screens in an outdoor theater and everybody could see it, you know you would be the most ashamed person in the whole world. Because there are things in your attitudes to others, just unquestioned attitudes of criticism, unquestioned attitudes of hatred and grudges and resentment that you would hate anyone to see. Now, loved ones, usually it's in those inner areas That's why we often call it inward sin, you see, as opposed to outward sins. And the reason why we have no revival among us is many of us are walking about in apparent outward victory, but inside our hearts are foul and unclean and filled with things that are not godly and are not Christ-like. And those are the things that destroy our witness. Now, if you said, well, what particular things... Well, you find them there in Galatians 5 and 19, if you wanted to look at it. Galatians 5 and 19. And uh, they're called, you remember, in the New Testament, the works of the flesh. Galatians 5 and 19. Now, the works of the flesh are plain. Immorality. Impurity, you see. These are attitudes, all the whys, all the why words are normally attitudes. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness. See, it's not just enough, loved ones, to hold back from unclean acts. It's, it's that God wants us to be free from a spirit of licentiousness. See, there's a real way in which I'm all for the sap coming up in the trees at springtime and all that, and it's beautiful. But there's a way, too, in which there's a, there can be a licentiousness in our lives. There can be an attitude of a liberty, even though it doesn't get outside. Now, that's what is not consistent, you see, with the spirit of the pure, tender Jesus that is dwelling within us. That's why he is uncomfortable so often in our lives, because he has to dwell with such unclean neighbors inside our hearts. And that's why there's always a struggle, because he will not stay there if you're going to keep that neighbor there, you see. One of them must go, and that's where the struggle comes from. Uh, idolatry, uh, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. 
uh, party spirit isn't where uh, this group on this side of the church get up and fight against this group on this side of the church. That isn't party spirit. Party spirit is where that's already beginning to move in your hearts, you see. Where we're already beginning to think of him as him or them as them and us as us. That's party spirit beginning to develop in our hearts. One, one track that I found was, was good for me uh, at the time that I needed to enter into the baptism of the Holy Spirit was this little one, and Roger is ordering more traits of the self-life. And it's good, you know, to ask yourself, have you any of these? Because, you see, the most, the most plain evidence that you're not baptized with the Spirit is your self-life. Your self-life. And it has these things. Are you ever conscious of a secret spirit of pride? An exalted feeling in view of your success or position because of your good training or appearance, because of your natural gifts and abilities. An important, independent spirit. Are you ever conscious of a love of human praise? A secret fondness to be noticed? A love of supremacy? A drawing attention to self in conversation? A swelling out of self when you have had a free time in speaking or praying? Are you ever conscious of the stirrings of anger or impatience, which worst of all you call nervousness or holy indignation? A touchy, sensitive spirit? A disposition to resent and retaliate when disapproved of or contradicted? A desire to throw sharp, heated flings at another? Are you ever conscious of self-will? A stubborn, unteachable spirit. An arguing, talkative spirit. Harsh, sarcastic expressions. An unyielding, headstrong disposition. A driving, commanding spirit. A disposition to criticize and pick flaws when set aside and unnoticed. A peevish, fretful spirit. A disposition that loves to be coaxed and humored. Are you ever conscious of carnal fear? A man-fearing spirit, a shrinking from reproach and duty, a reasoning around your cross. Are you ever conscious of a compromising spirit, a jealous disposition, a secret spirit of envy shut up in your heart, an unpleasant sensation in view of the great prosperity and success of another, a disposition to speak of the faults and failings rather than the gifts and virtues of those more talented and more appreciated than yourself. Are you ever conscious of a dishonest, deceitful disposition? The evading and covering of the truth. The covering up of your real faults. Leaving a better impression of yourself than is strictly true. False humility. Exaggeration. Straining the truth. Are you ever conscious of unbelief? A spirit of discouragement in times of pressure and opposition. Lack of quietness and confidence in God. Lack of faith and trust in God. A disposition to worry and complain in the midst of pain or at the dispensations of divine providence. An over-anxious feeling whether everything will come out all right. Are you ever conscious of selfishness, a love of ease, a love of money? Now, loved ones, do you see that God cannot use you if those things are down there? Loved ones, I don't care if you know Schaefer backwards. I don't care if you know Watchman Nee back to front. I don't care if you're a Baptist <laughs> or if you're a miserable poor Methodist like me. <laughs> but do you see that if you have those things deep down within, then the Holy Spirit has not filled you with himself. Some of once that's just true. You have not allowed him to deal with some areas in your life. Now, if you've come to the place, you know, where you say, well, Pastor, I believe I entered into a filling with the Holy Spirit. Well, then, brothers and sisters, thank the Holy Spirit for filling you and tell him about these things. Tell him, Holy Spirit, I know it's your desire for me to be completely cleansed from these things. Now, will you reveal to me what area of my life is not nailed to the cross with Christ? Now, that's it, loved one. Now, if you say, you know, how do you enter in? Dear ones, it's trust and obey. That's the way you enter into forgiveness of sins. You trust or you believe that Jesus died for your sins. And then you obey him absolutely. 
You let all those sins go from your own life and you obey him. It's the same with entering into victory over sin within. You trust and you believe that you were crucified with Christ. You believe that. That you died 1900 years ago. That that great person that your parents have made all the plans for, that you have made all the plans for, that the government has all the plans for, is actually dead. <laughs> and that your mind and body are available for the Holy Spirit to live the life of Jesus over again in. But that you are crucified. That you're dead with Christ. That you have no rights to your own way or your own rights or your own attitude. You have no right to assert yourself or defend yourself. And you were crucified with Christ. And now look to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, if there's any way in which I'm not really willing to be crucified, then will you let me know? Because do you see, dear ones, Believing is not matter of auto-suggestion, you see. The word for believe in the New Testament means obey. You can't believe unless you're willing to obey. I can't say I believe that chair will hold me unless I'm willing to step on that chair. Then in the New Testament sense, I believe. The word is pastuo in Greek. It means I obey what I believe. I do what I believe. Even the, the, the English words believe come from be in Anglo-Saxon and lefan, to be in accordance with. And until you actually are in accordance with what you say you believe, the Holy Spirit cannot fill you with himself. Now, you'll see that if you look at just uh, two verses there in Romans and then two in Galatians. Romans 6 and verse 11 explains how to enter into the baptism with the Holy Spirit or into full surrender or freedom from this desire to disobey God and have our own way. And it's there, Romans 6 and verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's it. That's what believing is. The word, you remember, is translated in the King James Version, reckon, and the Greek word for reckon means you don't only reckon it, you don't only imagine it, you are in that position. And for many of us, that is the real struggle in coming into the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It's coming to that place where we're actually willing to be crucified with Christ. Now, that's hard enough for because that means your future is not your own. That means, dear sisters, you cannot choose who you're going to marry. It means that there is no marriage ahead for you. There is only a marriage ahead for the Holy Spirit using your mind and body and emotions. Brothers, there is no future ahead for us. There are no jobs to plan for. There is only a future ahead for the Holy Spirit living inside our minds and bodies. It really means a funeral, you see. Somebody has said, oh, that death is more real than physical death. And brothers and sisters, I testified to it in my own life. You know, that was a death to all the things that I held dearest, all the things that I wanted myself. And God dealt w with each one of them and ask me, would you be willing to come to a place there where you're willing to be a failure for Jesus? Where you're willing to be nothing for him? Now, do you see, I can share these questions with you, but only the Holy Spirit can choose the area of your life where you're not willing to reckon yourself crucified with Christ. Now, in fact, you have been crucified. As far as God is concerned, he sees you crucified. But that can only be made real in you if you're willing for it to be made real, just as with the forgiveness of your sins. Now, you see, the second step is, after you've come to that place, Romans 8 and 13 is the way to live in this victory. Romans 8 and verse 13. In other words, you don't come to a place where you're really willing to be crucified with Christ and then start trying. No, Romans 8 and 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, the answer to every how in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit. Mary said, how shall these things be? The answer was, the Holy Spirit will conceive within you. Now, it's the same here. How can you walk in this victory? By instant obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit. So those are the two sides, dear ones. A reckoning that you have been crucified with Christ, that you have no rights to live your own life in your own way and then an, an absolute submission to the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, just point to two more verses, and, and then we'll have some questions if, if you want to ask. Galatians 3 and 24 and 25 state those two 
conditions that are necessary to be fulfilled in order to enter in. And I'm sorry, it is Galatians 5 and 24 and 25. Galatians 5 and 24 and 25. And the first, you see, is belief, is trust. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The flesh in the New Testament is not the body or even the sexual part of us. The flesh is, if you rearrange the words and leave one letter out, you get what it is. It's S-E-L-F. The flesh in the New Testament is self. The self-love that is not the kind of self-respect that God wants, but is a self-centered love, a self-deification, a self-glorification, a self-aggrandizement, you see. It is those things. Now, all of us, you see, who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Loved ones, as far as God is concerned, you don't have a future, you see. But you're arguing with them. You're saying, yes, Lord, I have a future, and I'm going to have a two-car garage, a motor lunch, and I'm going to have the best salary that I can possibly get my hands on. And the father has just a controversy with you. He says, no, my child, I crucified you with Jesus. I destroyed that evil inclination to have your own way with Jesus. And you must accept that. Otherwise, I cannot give you my Holy Spirit in his fullness. Now, that's the first step, you see, that realizing that you were crucified. And then verse 25, the obedience. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The way you walk in that victory is by instant obedience to the Holy Spirit. Now, just finish there that, you see, you cannot have instant obedience to the Holy Spirit if there is a great area of your life that you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to place on the cross. Then, of course, you're trying to believe over a half-committed and half-surrendered self. Well, that's impossible, you see, and you're always going to have difficulty obeying. Just one example. If your problem is anger, I think I used this before, or bad temper, the Holy Spirit will probably deal with what would be the consequences if you did not use anger or bad temper in your life. In other words, he'll probably point out to you, now listen, you know you use anger to keep people off. You know you use anger to control people. You use bad temper to let them see that you want your way. Now, would you be willing not to have your way? And then you will think in your mind, but Holy Spirit, if I don't get my way, at times these people would trample me underfoot. They would just walk over me. They would treat me as a doormat. The Holy Spirit will pin you on that and say, are you willing to be a doormat? Are you willing to be trampled underfoot as much as I want you to be? Are you willing for me to be your only defense? Are you willing for me to decide when to take the heat off? Now, when you're willing, you see, to face the consequences of not having anger and temper as a weapon against other people, then the Holy Spirit will move on to the next area in your life. And he will keep moving, dear ones, until he gets to the bottom of all your resistances to God's will. Now, that doesn't mean... He'll have no more light to show you. But he'll deal with all the areas where you have already rebelled against God. And he'll bring you down to the ground of your heart, Wesley said. You'll come to a place where you see the ground of your heart. And the Holy Spirit will witness you're in a place of full consecration, ready to be crucified with Jesus in your own life. And faith will spring up in your heart to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Faith is not a problem when you come to that place. Then it's a matter of walking in the same way as you entered in and obeying the Holy Spirit. Well, now, loved ones, will you, will you share questions? And Now, brothers and sisters, uh, did you see that uh, I'm glad to be asked a question that I can't answer? I, I, there was a day when I was concerned about that and anxious always to have an answer. But I want you to ask questions. They may be even... Well, if they're, if they're hostile questions, don't ask them in a hostile way. I ask them in a loving way. But you see that I'm, I want to find truth. Don't you, don't you think, uh, if you have the truth there, don't keep it wrapped up, you see. Share it and, and push me. Chris is asking, does God break us individually of different areas? And what she has found at times is that she's been broken in a certain area and later on it has cropped up. Do you see, dear ones, that the common misunderstanding of growing in grace is that God gradually breaks us of all the things that we're doing wrong in our lives over a period of time. That's the normal misunderstanding of growing in grace. Uh, dear ones, don't realize that growing in grace only takes place after you've been crucified with Christ. 
It only takes place after you've entered into resurrection life. Growth and grace implies growth in the grace and the beauty of our Lord Jesus. Not growth out of our own ugliness. That is something that is achieved by Christ's death on the cross. And so the important thing, I think, to see, Chris, is that no, the heart of all these areas is self. That is the reason why we're bad-tempered. It's the reason why we're jealous, why we're proud. All those things can be traced back to self. And what the Holy Spirit does is he'll deal with certain areas. He'll ask us to walk in obedience in those areas. We'll have to, in other words, start walking in obedience. We don't want to wait for a great blockbuster someday when he'll blast through everything. If the Holy Spirit shows me some area, I need to walk in obedience in that area, but I need to see that what the Holy Spirit wants to get at is the great self deep down. And so I know, Chris, for me, I had to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me, I see my anger, I see my ambition, but reveal to me how that comes from self. And how that great self underneath me is like an iceberg, a tenth on the surface. A tenth on the surface that shows a little bit of anger or pride, but underneath nine tenths that I cannot see. And will you show me that great self and show me that it is hostile to God? Show me the exceeding sinfulness of that. Because, Chris, if you had pointed out some other things in my life, I would have said, well, they're just little things. I mean, those I can overcome gradually. But it was only when the Holy Spirit gave me revelation and light to see that self as a, re- a rebel against God that I really saw that that needed to be destroyed by God. Rendered inoperative is a better word because there's nothing destroyed forever. It's only put on the cross and held there by the power of the Holy Spirit. As soon as we cease to believe, it comes back down again. So it's held there by the power of faith and willing submission to the Holy Spirit. But it is, as far as we're concerned, it's dead because it's rendered inoperative by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So that would be my answer. That you need to walk in obedience as the Holy Spirit reveals to you, but the, the, the issue is to get to that heart of self. Otherwise, the things will just crop up again. Otherwise, you're just treating the symptoms of the disease and the disease is still there. The just shall live by faith, Gail. We have to steer well clear of the emphasis that some dear ones, in uh, well-intentioned they were, but it is not scripture, where they say the flesh, you see, can be once and for all done away with so that you never, you never have to remember it again. You'll never sin again. Once you've entered into crucifixion with Christ, you'll never sin again. Now, Gail, I see no reason why you should ever sin again. But that's because of continual exercise of faith and submission to the Holy Spirit. In other words, you cannot get to the point where you say, whether I exercise faith or submission to the Holy Spirit, I'll never sin again because that's once and for all crucified. Well, that's a wrong understanding of inward sin. Inward sin and a carnal nature is not an appendix that you take out and put on the cross. It is an attitude within us. You say to a person, uh, that Phil is very generous. Yes, that's his nature. That's the way he's built. It's just his whole attitude in life. Now, that's it's in that sense that we mean we have a carnal nature. But that's an attitude that can be held on the cross by the power of the Holy Spirit as long as we believe, as long as we trust and obey. Uh, once the Holy Spirit has revealed to you that there's something like pride in your life, how can you know that you're willing to give it up unless you give it up? And presumably, Steve would go the other step by saying, surely you can only walk in obedience if the Holy Spirit enables you to. Now, do you see, dear ones, that the Holy Spirit knows if you're willing to give it up, Steve. That's why I've mentioned the witness of the Holy Spirit to your full consecration. It's not a question, you see, of wandering through this and wondering, am I fully consecrated? Well, I feel a bit more consecrated than last time. I think I am. No. The Holy Spirit comes and the, the New Testament says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stamps the seal upon us and says, yes, you're fully consecrated. And I remember in my own heart, I came to a place where I knew that witness of the Holy Spirit. He hadn't filled me at that point, but he witnessed that I was fully consecrated. And so that's it. The Holy Spirit will witness, Steve, when you've come to the ground of your own heart, when you've come to the end of yourself. Diane says, then there'll never be a time when we have everything fully given over. The Holy Spirit will always be showing us more things. Now, here's the distinction I'd make, uh, Diane that most of us, after walking in Jesus for six months a year, the Holy Spirit 
begins to show us things where we ought to move out after him. Maybe in witnessing in school, which concerns our reputation, we want to be thought a swinger, and the Holy Spirit tells us to witness and be a square. And we stand back on that, and our reputation becomes precious to us. And that, it's those resistances to the Father's will that we've already established. It's those things that the Holy Spirit wants to clear away. And you're right, when he comes to the bottom of those, he will fill us, and then he will give us more light on other areas that we've never seen before. But do you see, when it comes to those, the resistance of our will will have been cleansed away by the filling of the Holy Spirit, and we'll walk willingly and obediently into those other areas. Well, as far as God is concerned, you're clear at that point. The Father regards you as perfect at that moment, you think. Because the Father says, you are sin is anybody who knows what is right to do it and fails to do it. For him it is sin. Now, my dear child, if you are walking in obedience to me and have no resistance to anything that I've shown you in the past, then as far as I'm concerned, you are perfect in my sight. And the Father, you see, he knows a whole lot of other things where we could walk in greater perfection, but they are not, uh, they are not obligatory on us until the Holy Spirit brings them to our hearts. Of course, he can always tell whether we're walking purposely blind to the Holy Spirit or not. The Holy Spirit knows. That's why, loved ones, I've shared with you the importance of the Holy Spirit as the counselor in this, you see. He alone knows whether you're being honest or not. I don't know. Your, your wife doesn't know. Your best friend doesn't know. The Holy Spirit knows if you're being honest. And that's, he determines his filling of your life by your honesty with him. Mark, uh, there, is, there can be no separation. If we're dealing with New Testament Christianity, there can be no separation between belief and obedience. But you see that today, you're right, what we have shared is cheap grace, you see. Bless our hearts, our tendency is to present it as a hedonistic offer to people. And it's ridiculous, you see. We say, now listen, if you continue as you are, you'll have a miserable life and you'll go to hell. Now, if you accept Jesus, you'll have a great life and you'll go to heaven. Well, anyone in their right senses will choose the latter. You know, they'll say, well, I'd rather have a good life here and go to heaven. And we preach, you see, all they have to do is accept Jesus. And the emphasis has been on accept. And we've thought it was the idea of accepting that he's the son of God, accept all the things they say about him, and generally try to live like him. But the New Testament experience is repent, uh, a, a radical repentance, a turning from all our sins, an absolute obedience to him, and a receiving his spirit into our hearts. Yeah. It's, it's trust and obey. Right? And that's why, you see, we have so many, we call them conversions. They're not really, you know. We call them even intellectual Christians. They're kind of intellectual conversions, most of them. They're giving intellectual assent to the truth of Scripture and trying hard. That's really what many of them must 